And that does not make the ruling nobles and lords of the industrial castles happy. Yeah. <laughs> because if this actually becomes widely adapted, their power, prestige, position, and profits will collapse. And people ask me, you know, when I talk, when I talk about how, how wonderful our farming is and it's economically and emotionally profitable and it's all this cool stuff, you know, they say, well, if it's so great, why doesn't everybody do it? Because if everybody did this, it would completely invert the power, position, prestige, and profits of the entire food and farming system in the world. And that's a big ship to turn around. And that ship is not going to go dancing nicely into the night any more than the nobles and dukes of, of, uh, of fiefdoms and, and feudalism went dancing gently into the night when gunpowder extended the pitchfork reach of the peasants. And we now have, we now have miniature technology. We have little thermometers. We have stainless steel. We have plastic pipe. We have refrigeration, on-farm energy generation. We have all sorts of cool, um, miniaturized, localized, farm-scale, individualized, James Dale Davidson, sovereign individual idea, okay? We have all of that now at our fingertips, but during this hundred years of industrial economy to the downsized, restructured, miniaturized, information-based economy has risen a consumer asked for, a voter asked for labyrinth of regulatory oversight over the opaqueness of the industrial sector. And we now, trying to access markets, are being forced by this labyrinth of bureaucracy to squeeze our little homemade pickles <laughs> and our backyard chickens and our two raw milk cows through a, a, a screen, through a, a, a protective hurdle of regulatory infrastructure that is prejudicial against everything small-scale, localized, transparent, and has integrity. So what do we do? I mean, on our farm, you know, there, I wrote a book, Everything I Want to Do is Illegal. You know, and there are tons of things that we would like to do. I mean, we, we have so segregated our culture, and I like the word segregated because it's such a powerful word, and I always ask bureaucrats, you know, why do you want a segregated society? Um, and and what, it, what it means is that we are now denying our entire culture the innovation that happens on the lunatic edge of prototypes. See, the way innovation comes, I'm, I'm enjoying watching these uh, hula hoops up here, all right? Now, now imagine, imagine the first guy that developed the hula hoop. Now, I'll bet you that it wasn't a pretty hula hoop like this. I'll bet it was some guy that had a a little, uh, you know, 13-year-old wiry daughter, right? And uh, she had a bicycle, and maybe the maybe the wheel went kaput, you know. And so there's an extra rim with no spokes lying around, and she just kind of walks over one day, and you know, picks up this this uh, bicycle rim, and and uh, you know, starts playing around with it. Her dad comes out and says, wow, that's cool, you know, and a little neighbor girl comes over, you know, and, and she, oh, can I play with that, you know, and the dad starts, you know, he's an entrepreneur, and he starts thinking, and he starts, oh, wow, you know, if I could make that, anyway, and that's probably how the hula hoop develops, you know, this, this, this serendipitous, embryonic kind of aha thing with an opportunity. Now, let me ask you this, if that guy, in order to make his very first prototype, had to have a $500,000 quintuple permitted workman's comp uh, uh, guaranteed OSHA approved phone and office uh, and handicapped parking and the whole plethora of, of, of building inspections and all that on his little workshop to build his prototype, when would hula hoops have come to market? They wouldn't have. They never would have. And so the fact is that when it comes to to what's possible with food. You know, people accuse me of being an elitist. You know, your food is higher priced. Let me tell you why our food's higher priced. 
Because we can't butcher a cow on the farm, a calf that was born, raised. We can't butcher that cow on the farm and sell it to a neighbor across the fence. We've got to take that cow or steer or calf or whatever and put it on a trailer Send it 30 miles up the interstate, which is already crowded. I mean, we need more taxes to build more roads, right? To go to a federal inspected facility, which is small scale and has the same paperwork as a, as a, a 5,000 employee IBP plant, which charges us $50 to do what a large plant does. I mean, charges us $400 to do what a large plant does for $50 because we only do 50 beeves a week at our little federal inspected slaughterhouse, and we have the same paperwork as one that does 5,000 a week. And so the overhead of the regulation and the bathroom for the inspector and the, 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 the reports and the thermometers and the paint that meets code and the workman's comp digest and the and the, the the insurance liability paperwork and all of the minutiae and all of the bureaucrats that show up in their limousines with their badges and ask silly questions all day and take our work away we don't have we don't have 5,000 animals a week to spread the overhead of all that cost over let me give you an example Two years ago, my partner who owns this plant with me called me in a panic said we just got shut down for an egregious Animal abuse violation. Well, here's what happened. We had an inspector. He was sent to another plant. I mean, can't let him get too cozy, right? And so we got a brand new inspector, you know, a young lady, first job, straight out of college, you know, and she was given the riot act when she came to You make sure you get a handle on this place. You show them who's boss. Don't let those guys, you know, push you around. All right, so she comes in all nervous and, you know, first day on the job. The Friday before the Monday, our old kill floor guy had retired. So we moved up the second in command to the top spot. And so here we have Monday morning, we have a brand new inspector and a brand new guy on the, on the kill floor. A pig comes into the knock box. We do the stun gun, the guy's nervous, the inspector's all nervous, everybody's all in a big dither. The guy misses the spot on the pig. The pig squeals and goes ballistic, all right? He hits it again with a stun, with, with, with a bolt, knocks it down, and the inspector writes us up for a felonious animal abuse violation and closes the plant for a week. We have people out of work. We can't pay our bills. We've got animals sitting that can't be processed because we're in an egregious animal abuse violation. It takes us a week to finally work through it. Finally, the next Monday, we get back up and running. And here's, you ready for the bottom line? The bottom line is See, we have to have a HACCP plan. A HACCP plan is Hazardous Analysis Critical Control Point plan with all the boxes checked and the bureaucracy checked off. So here we have this, this HACCP plan, and our HACCP plan says, you know, animal walks in the knock box, administer um, captive bolt, slit throat. All right. Well, our animal walked in the knock box. We administered the captive bolt. It was administered incorrectly and we needed to do it a second time. Well, our HACCP plan didn't say if A fails, you know, it didn't have a B step, if A fails, repeat A. If we had had on our HACCP plan a B that said if A fails, repeat step A, we would have been in complete compliance. But see, in our little plant with 18 employees and my partner, we don't have time to go to all the trade association meetings that the big boys go to at the big fancy country clubs to play golf and commiserate with the top dogs of the inspecting association to learn how the game is played. We're just trying to do our work, trying to keep a little plant in a community embedded, nested in a community at an appropriate scale that doesn't stink up the neighborhood and hires legal workers. You know, we're trying to keep this little thing in business. And so this is the, so the fact is that every single time, can I say that again? Every single time the government gets in and manipulates the marketplace, it's prejudicial against small scale and against innovative businesses every single time.
And I can keep you up all night with personal stories of how this happens. Let me give you another one. Workman's comp. Workman's comp. Uh, you know, if you have three employees, you got to have workman's comp. So we got to that point. All right, so we got to have workman's comp. Well, we run a pastured livestock operation that direct markets to, you know, restaurants and, 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 and direct families. So we have a delivery driver, Big Richard. Great guy, you know, and he's our delivery driver and takes boxes of eggs and frozen meat and stuff, you know, to our restaurants and our customers in the city. When it comes time to fill out workman's comp forms, it turns out, which are, of course, required by law, we're a farm. We can't have a delivery driver that handles boxes of frozen product. Farms don't do that. The only driver or delivery person that a farm can have is a live animal hauler, which is extremely risky. I mean, you know, a steer can kick you and break your leg. You know, you're, you're dealing with live animals here, right? Very, very high risk. So here we are having to pay thousands of dollars in workman's comp for a, a worker that we don't even have because we're a farm and the government says a farm can't have a delivery driver that handles frozen product. That's not what farms do. Farms are supposed to be, farmers are supposed to be colonial serfs and peasants just producing raw commodities for the value-added urban banking sector that extracts the wealth from the countryside and, and gets wealthy on the backs of farmers. That's what farmers are for. And so when people say your food is high priced, these are the kinds of things that create an incredibly elitist mentality, but it has nothing to do with real efficiency and real costs. It has to do with the small scale prejudice in the government rule book concerning market access. And see, this has nothing to do with quality. This has nothing to do with food safety. I mean, that's what they want you to think it has. But I want you to remember this. You know, you can, the, the government actually encourages you to go out on a 70-degree November day, because you get a few of those in November, and shoot, and shoot a deer that might have Creutzfeldt Jakob's disease. That's mad deer instead of mad cow. Um, but nobody checks it. Nobody cares, right? Um, shoot that deer. On a 70 degree day, drag it a mile through the squirrel dung and the sticks and rocks and then proudly place it on the front of your blazer and drive down through town in a setting uh, sun for three hours to show your trophy to everybody and then string it up in a backyard tree and let it sit for a week when the, underneath the roosting birds who poop on it and then next week skin it out and, and feed it to your children and your friends. And you're being a great patriotic American when you do that. In Virginia, we have hunters for the hum hungry. So if you don't want that deer, you can actually give all the meat to orphans and impoverished people. I mean, we don't care if they die. Let's just give them, you know, junk, whatever. That's cool. Uh, it'll reduce the social roles, right? To, 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 right? But nobody asks. But if you, if you take an appropriate temperature day and dress a chicken in the backyard, and sell it to a neighbor, you're a criminal. See, it's not about food safety. It's all about circling the wagons to so carefully and narrowly codify market access that it protects the entrenched players from competition from upstarts like us. And the... the, the and, and the problem, as we, as we you know, articulate this in our culture, is that this, this loss of food choice and food freedom in the marketplace has moved so slowly that people don't realize what's been lost. You know, they go to the supermarket and look at all that variety in the supermarket. I mean, it's basically just, you know, repackaged ways to, to put different color packaging around GMO corn and soybeans. But look at all that variety in the supermarket and say, what do you mean we don't have food choice? We got, we got, I mean, now we can get, you know, uh, uh, um, Twizzlers and um, um, M&Ms and Snicker bars and, you know, uh, um, 
Eggos and Pop Tarts and Count Chocula cereal and Mountain Dew. What do you mean we don't have choice? We got way more choice. And it's really hard to build a, a, a groundswell, a, a, a revolt, if you will, for something that people don't realize they've lost. But trust me, if we, if we emancipated food from its enslavement right now to the bureaucracy of government control, if we, you know, if, if we could extract food and farming today from this inquisition of orthodoxy that takes heretics like me, you know, and, and, and essentially, you know, burns us at the stake, if we could free up our food system, it would just open up an incredible entrepreneurial innovation to solve all the problems that the industry has right now. This industrial food system has created a whole nightmare, uh, a, a, a whole um, a cornucopia of problems. You know, anybody over 45 can't remember saying the word Campylobacter, E. coli, Salmonella. We didn't say that when we were kids. We can't remember C. diff and MRSA, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, mad cow. All of those have been created by an industry run amok that's given grand concessions by the regulators. You know, people talk about the lobbyists. We've got way too many lobbyists. We want to regulate lobbyists. What we need to do is just eliminate the governmental manipulation of the marketplace and there won't be any lobbyists needed to buy anything because there won't be any concessions. The only reason we have lobbyists is because there's so much, there's so many concessions and spe special privileges to buy. As soon as we eliminate that, there's nothing to buy and all the lobbyists go home. So. So where we are is if we really freed up this, the, the food and farming system to be able to participate in commerce like it did prior to 1906 when Teddy Roosevelt decided to shut it down and, and, the, and, and, and gave in to the big players' request. You see, what people don't realize is that within six months of the jungle being published in 1906, 50% of the market of the big players uh, uh, dropped. It went away. And people went to their local butchers. And so the big players came to Teddy Roosevelt and begged him, please start a regulatory agency so that we can put a stamp on it and get credibility back with customers. Being the communist that he was, he said, sure, I'll do that. And so he gave them that, and the big players have been hiding behind the skirts of the regulators ever since. Whenever there's a recall, whenever there's a pathogen foodborne illness problem, what's the first thing that the corporate CEO says? We have followed all the USDA mandates. We have, you know, we have followed all the licenses, right? That's the first thing they say. There's not an apology to the people they hurt. It is, it is hiding behind this facade of food safety, which is not food safety at all. It's simply a cleverly articulated place to give special market consideration to the biggest players and protect them from upstarts like us. What would we have if we really emancipated food? What we would have is, a, is an absolute uh, a tsunami a tsunami of entrepreneurial embryonic startups. You see, innovation always starts from prototypes. If in order to start an innovative new product, the capitalization costs, the overhead costs, and the licensure costs to introduce that product to market, if they are so big that the embryo has to be large to be birthed, the embryo is never birthed. And that's the great tragedy and evil, evil of government manipulation of the marketplace. It is that it, it denies, it denies us the ability to interact with the greatest ideas of prototype thinkers 
and it denies the greatest prototype thinkers the ability to bring their product in an in a embryonic prototype to market. And so what we're left with is just soil and green and whatever the bureaucracy thinks is okay, which has morphed into a fact that now it is officially safe to feed your kids Cocoa Puffs, Count Chocula, Mountain Dew, and Twizzlers, but it is criminal and hazardous substance and unsafe to feed them raw milk, Aunt Matilda's homemade pickles, and, 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 and Grandma's uh, compost-grown tomatoes. And so what we've done is so carefully proscribed what's available in the marketplace that under the guise of food safety, we have protected ourselves even if we said that it was efficacious and protected us from bad food, a system that so narrowly prescribes us so that we can't risk a bad decision of you know, buying somebody's uh, bad food that is so, so protects us from the risk of a bad decision also protects us from the innovation of a good decision. And so here we are with pasture-based livestock, cottage-based, cottage industry entrepreneurs with stainless steel and thermometers and indoor plumbing and hot water facing a, a whole labyrinth of infrastructure mandates that are scale prejudicial that were developed during the abuses of the rise of the industrial economy as we enter now this cool, refined, miniaturized, downsized information economy with a localized commerce, food is still held in this, in this prison of industrial paradigms. We have the answer to E. coli. We have the, we, goodness, we've even sent our chicken manure to the lab. We don't even have uh, salmonella in our manure. I mean, you can eat our manure. and We're the only ones that don't feed you our manure. <laughs> we have, we have the answer to all of these problems. You know, let's take a really hot, let's take a really hot one, um, uh, food deserts. You know, people look at me, they say, you're a food elitist, look at the price of your food. You know, what are you going to do about the poor, you know, single mom with four kids in a food desert in the middle of a city? And libertarians kind of sometimes back up on this because we don't want welfare, we don't want handouts. We, oh, we're gonna... You know what the answer is? The answer is, to free up the entrepreneurs, and there are still some, in those areas, in those food deserts, where gangs are, yes, but there are a lot of vacant lots. You know, Baltimore has 40,000 acres of vacant land in the city of Baltimore. I mean, every urban sector has tons and tons of acreages of vacant lots. St. Louis has, has thousands of acres. You know, Detroit has almost millions of acres. I mean, all this vacant land, all right? If a person could go out to a vacant lot and grow a garden, and have some rabbits and chickens there, and make some pot pies and quiche in their kitchen, maybe they got culinary skills, make it in their kitchen for their neighbors in the condominium complex and the apartment complex, it wouldn't be a food desert. But you let one entrepreneur try to grow a garden in that lot, have some chickens in there, and, and use their kitchen for making pot pies, heavy stews, and quiche for their apartment uh, friends in, in the complex, and by 5 o'clock, they're going to have five knocks on their doors from 10 different government agencies demand, saying, oh, this is a residential area. You can't have a business here. Oh, uh, if you're going to use this to sell, and you've got you've to get uh, commercial-grade uh, commercial rafters in the roof to handle more snow load. You've got to have uh, commercial bathrooms with handicapped... Uh, access so you got to knock out your walls get handicapped you know and and we've got to have uh, food licenses and you know is that pot uh, uh, licensable where's your HACCP plan and it's this whole list of things and so what we have is all the liberals running around trying to figure out how to food bank these people into food security when the food security is right under their nose but their own regulations deny people the freedom to access the abundance that the earth wants them to have right under their nose <laughs> The answer is to take all the time and energy that's been devoted to developing the, the campaign to label GMOs and turn it instead on, on mealy-mouthed, mamby-pamby district attorneys who are failing to enforce trespass law that dates back to the Magna Carta. You know, 
when Monsanto's patented life forms, inherently promiscuous, I might add, come across and perform sexual orgies in my fields and give me life forms that I don't want, that's called trespass. And if your life form, let's say you have a bull, and your bull comes over to my place and tramples my flower bed, the district attorney will immediately make you liable for that damage, that trespass of my property. In our culture, we've deviated so far from reason and property rights and individual freedom that now not only is Monsanto not liable for trampling my flower bed with their bull, I have to pay them for the privilege of their bull coming and trampling my flower bed. <laughs> Libertarians have the answers for all these things. It's not every time we have a problem when we ask for a remedy from the government, we're showing an incredibly uncreative mindset. There, there are so many creative answers to food security, to, to uh, GMO problems, to the power of, 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 of large corporations. People say, well, well, well you know, well, the problem is that, that freedom is what got us where we, where we were. I mean, it, it's because of a free market that Monsanto's as big as it is, or, or you know, Siba Geige or uh, Archer Daniels Midland, you know, the reason, and Kellogg's and, and Dean Foods, and what, the reason they're so big is because of freedom. No, it's not. The reason they're so big is because the government has been manipulating the food and farming marketplace for so long, we haven't had a free market in food ever since Abraham Lincoln decided, you know, he was another commie, um, ever since he decided to form the U.S. DAW. You know, the worst president was Abraham Lincoln. He's the one that gave us the U.S. DAW and told us the government should tell us how to grow things and what to eat. I mean, look at, look at... Look at what happened when the government decided to tell us what to eat with the food pyramid. 1979, right? The food pyramid comes out. You know, carbohydrates on the bottom. You know, Twinkies, Cocoa Puffs, and Mountain Dew on the bottom. You know, that's, that, that's all the grains, right? And, and, and suddenly, we got type 2 diabetes, and we got uh, um, um, obesity, all right? And these are epidemic now in our culture, and you can trace it directly back to the U.S. duh telling us what to eat. I mean, I think it's probably amazing that, that we would be a far healthier culture if the government had never told us how to eat, and now we're telling them we want you responsible for our health. You know, this all comes down to, th th this ability to choose comes down to the question of who owns the individual. 30 years ago, many of us were fighting for homeschooling freedom. And we were waking up every morning to the New York Times headlines quoting the educated, academic, cerebral, you know, expert talking heads of the educational movement predicting if we let this, this, this abnormal, aberrant behavior, the, 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 this despicable idea of, of, of homeschooling to proliferate, well, my goodness, uh, we, we won't be able to have enough jails to put in all the miscreants and enough insane asylums to handle all the socially deprived children and, and enough, you know, uh, um, job shops and, and uh, work release programs for all of the, you know, um, um, educationally challenged, uh, you know, idiots that are going to come out of this system. And, and we saw this every day. Well, here we are 30 years later. Not only did that not happen, but I don't even know the most, you know, uh, aggressive public educator in the country who, if you really asked them in the quietness of their own heart, do you really think our culture would be richer if we had continued to criminalize homeschooling? I think even the most diehard public educationist would say, oh, I think I I'm glad that our culture has allowed that to happen. Today, we are in food where we were with education 40 years ago. Then it was who owns the child. Today, it's who owns the individual. That's the question. My freedom to choose is, di is directly related to who owns my body. You see... What's happened is our culture in the name of health, safety, and wealth.